We're super excited to present this topic. It is Advanced Scleral Lens Evaluation and Empirical Fitting. And I'm here with a very, very dear friend of mine, Dr. Tom Arnold. And before we get started, Tom, would you mind giving the listeners just a brief kind of bio of, of who you are and kind of maybe how you got involved in this type of technology to begin with? Sure. Well, well, the, the long short story is that I've been in practice since 1984. I opened my own practice in 1992. And uh, so I'm a private practitioner uh, just outside of Houston, Texas in Sugarland. And uh, we have two other doctors with us. And I just started out as general optometry, selling glasses and contacts and just just doing uh, like any other uh, private optometrist but I always like contacts I always uh, had a grounding in, in gas permeables and, and multifocals and so forth uh, so I'm just booking along uh, I knew about sclerals you know when they started to become available you know in the early 2000 and so but I didn't feel like I, I had that niche um, and I was encouraged by a corneal specialist that I did a lot of work with uh, to start fitting and uh, rather reluctantly, I kind of drug my, my feet a while, but uh, I was encouraged and the, I actually went to a, uh, uh, my first meeting to be introduced to Sclerals was with uh, a good mentor of yours, Stephanie, Ed Bennett and Greg Denier. And actually Greg Denier is the first one that put a Sclerals lens on me. Uh, and I was, you know, very amazed how comfortable they were. And uh, my next patient who was uh, a good candidate I bought a fitting set and put it on and you know once you start fitting these wonderful wonderful lenses and see the the, the joy uh, that they bring to patients and the impact on their lives you're hooked so I've been fitting sclerals now for about eight years you know, out of a 34 year uh, you know a 36 year career that's awesome thanks Tom and, and you guys can see how well versed Tom is in uh, in scleral lens fitting and and uh, He's got such cool photos and um, case reports on, on his Facebook and Instagram pages. And he also is an administrator of the Scleral Lens Practitioner Facebook group, which is really cool where we get to share a lot of cool case reports and get some troubleshooting tips. So thanks, Tom, for, for being here. And uh, just a quick um, brief bio on myself. I, I also was kind of like Tom um, in the beginning when I started practicing about 10 years ago. I was basically joined up with a private practice doing everything, glasses, contacts, red eyes, uh, diabetic exams, post-ops, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I had completed a residency, so I really wanted to integrate scleral lens fitting into it. And so I started fitting scleral lenses, uh, you know, during school and then during my residency, which is just kind of when they started to get popular again. <clears throat> and then, yeah, then I just kind of incorporated that into private practice. And now I have a new practice in Las Vegas and that's all I do. So I only do specialty contact lenses at this practice now. And uh, I think all of you viewers are gonna learn all there is to know, or at least we're gonna try to educate you as much as possible on kind of how, um, scleral lens evaluation has really evolved over time. So thank you guys all for, for being here tonight. We also want to say thank you to Visionary Optics. Uh, this event is supported with an unrestricted educational grant from them. And both uh, Dr. Arnold and I are very lucky to work with lots of different companies. And so before we kind of jump into just diving right into the scleral prophylometry or topography. Dr. Arnold and I, we kind of talked about some of the, the things that kind of evolved over time and some of the, the things that happened with us in our own careers. And something that I remember, um, I believe it was Christine Sint, uh, you know, amazing doctor. And at one of the meetings, she said something in, in one, at, I think it was at GSLS. And she said, remember, that with scleral lenses, you're taking the cornea out of the equation. You're fitting the sclera itself. You're not really fitting the cornea. So that like really resonated with me. And I just thought, huh, I think I've been taking these topographies of the cornea a little bit too literal in the sense of all of my fitting uh, choices were kind of based off of that initial topography. And then as you start fitting these things more, you realize, huh, you know what, 
the scleral shape and the scleral topography and what, whatever the sclera is doing is, um, is, is incredibly important to how the end result is, uh, is, is going to be. Um, so Dr. Arnold, I just, I wanted to ask you, you know, would you find that eight years ago when you started fitting these, um, that the shapes have changed or the fitting sets have changed or what has your kind of been your yeah. experience like as this has evolved? Well, just like you, Stephanie, uh, you know, the original scar lenses, the, the big 21, 23 millimeter lenses uh, that some of our early developments were developers were using, you know, they had spherical haptics because they were, they said they weren't sealed lenses. They ex expected some tear exchange. One, because the, the materials were not very permeable. And two, they didn't have the technology to map the scar. So they just made something big enough to stick. And as the, as the lenses got smaller, the techniques, uh, the, the manufacturing techniques got more sophisticated and the lenses became smaller. Then, then you have this very torque sclera, you know, come into play. And my first couple of fitting sets had spherical haptics. And I remember my, my little anecdote was with another you know, mentor and, and icon for us is Lynette Johns. And I got to know Lynette um, pretty well over the years and, and she's a, a very good friend. And I remember attending one of her early lectures and she was saying something like uh, 90, 95% of all my uh, lenses now have a torque haptic. And I had just used one or two lenses at that time and I don't think I had any of them torque. And I went, wow, that, that's incredible. You know, what, you know I, I never thought of that or I, I didn't think I saw the need. But then when the realization came away that with the torque haptic, it really does fit better. And uh, uh, so, yeah, it was, everything evolves. And so uh, I was taken aback by that, but uh, soon saw the light. Yeah. And it's interesting that these, the companies, like you said, Tom, they started off with just spherical back surfaces because there wasn't a lot of information or research. Um, and, and to your and, point too, too Stephanie, uh, you know, the early sets because people understood topography and, and, and these were rigid lenses, some of the early fitting sets, you know, the, the lenses were described in, in K readings, even though they're scarl lenses, you know, they would say, well, fit yeah. half adopter steeper than the flat K. So they were still referencing the cornea even yep. though we're fitting scarls. I'm sure you you have a couple of fit sets like that as well. Oh yeah. It's just, it's really interesting um, where things have, have, how things have progressed. Uh, so just like Tom said, most of the fitting sets like 10 years ago had just spherical back surfaces and we didn't have a ton of information about scleral shape really at all. And the other thing is when you, even if you could have deduced that, putting a lens on and saying, huh, you know, this doesn't look like it's fitting the eye properly. A lot of the fitting sets back then just didn't even have the option to add toricity on the back surface, which is totally different from now. I just wanted to go through quickly just a, a, a study that um, Dr. Arnold and I, we both reference this a lot and a lot of our good friends that were involved. But this really was a, a eye opener, I think, for a lot of people in the industry that were fitting scleral lenses to any extent. So basically um, at Pacific University, they took 96 eyes and they used a Visante OCT to uh, take a look basically at how things were um, angled on, on the, where the limbus was and then all the way out to like a 20 millimeter cord length. So if this, if you all are slightly familiar with the OCT, they measured from basically the limbus down to a, a 15 millimeter cord length. And then they repeated another scan uh, where they're going from uh, 15 millimeter cord length to 20 millimeter to just kind of understand what's going on with the shape of the sclera. So as you can see here, this is kind of the first scan on, on a, one of their eyeballs. So going from basically the limbus, you know, to a 15, millimeter cord length and you can see the different degrees and they're quite similar as far as you know 37.7 37 or 38 you know they're all kind of um, similar not all the same so certainly not spherical uh, but not a huge varying degrees 
Uh, but then as we get larger or, or, you know, out into this 15 to 20 millimeter cord, you're really starting to notice a lot of different uh, shapes going on. So you've got this huge vari variability the further you get through the limbus. This is kind of that information put together. So if you were looking at a, an eyeball straight on, like if you're looking through the slit lamp and you're looking at this blue thing, pretending it's the cornea, you can see that as you kind of get further away from the limbus, the sclera does in fact become more toric. And then here's just another uh, bar graph if it, just to kind of show you that when you're in that uh, 10 to 15 millimeters, it's, it's not as variable as uh, when you get to these, these larger cord lengths. So I think that was really, really important to um, the industry. This type of research was showing that, you know what? As we get further away from the limbus, we really should start to look at adding in some toricity to the back surface. And I remember, Tom, the same thing as you, as when I read that there was a study that Dr. Greg Denaer posted, I, I think it was in contact lens spectrum in the beginning, but he talked about how a majority of his um, fits had like a, a, a back surface toricity and he only had like 20% that had a spherical toricity and then the rest of the 80% or something was, was toric in some way. And I was like, you know what? I, mine's completely backwards. I had 80% yeah. in spherical back surface and then I had like 20% that were in toric and I'm like, there's something wrong with this picture. So I, I agree with you, Tom. I think that it's something that, that we all kind of discovered. And I'd love if you kind of talked to this uh, slide. I think this is so important. Um, oh, good. This, in, this information. Yeah, really. It, um, th the fact is the spiral of Tolot, which of course we all remember from ocular anatomy, you know, it's just a recognition that the extraocular muscles insert at different distances from the limbus. Um, and so, you know, that's, we, we, we've understood that for, for some time, but the unique thing about the slides that you just presented, Stephanie, from, from Pat Caroline or Andy Kojima and, and so forth, that Pacific study was that not only are the, the, is the distance different out to the extraocular muscles, but the elevation of these areas is different. And the, the angles are very straight or very tangent. You know, looking, if, if you have the time to look back at those slides, you'll see that uh, once they get off the, the cornea and get beyond the limbus, those angles are very, extremely straight. And so we're used to thinking of curved corneas um, and we're used to thinking of the globe and it's like a big basketball. But actually, once you get, once you get onto the sclera proper from the limbus, things become very straight. And so you'll see this in some of the newer designs uh, of the scleral lenses that, you know, you have curved, um, you know, base curves and mid periphery curves, limbal curves, but then when you get on these haptics, some of which become very, very straight and flat. And so I think that, and also um, not only is the, the angle different, but the elevation of these areas is, is much different. Yeah. The geometry Thanks. helps illustrate Thanks. that. That's uh, something that I don't think we really knew. And uh, probably a lot of our listeners are just learning this information for the first time. So thanks for explaining that, was, that was excellent. Um, so here's another study that, uh, that Tom actually had in one of his last uh, most recent presentations. But uh, basically the, in, in, one, in one of these journals and, and a lot of these different articles, it shows that only 6% of patients that wear sclerals actually uh, had a spherical sclera and only 29% exhibited regular scleral tericity. So Tom, when you look at this study, are you thinking in your head, huh, if only 29% have regular scleral tericity, that means that the majority of patients in my chair have irregular scleral tericity. Is that what you are seeing now yeah, that you are? Absolutely. Okay. And that, that number resonates with me, uh, um, Stephanie. I bet you I only have about 5% of my fits have a spherical haptic. I mean, so I'm, I'm you know, 
uh, Lynette Johns was way ahead of me eight years ago. So it's probably, you know, 95% toric. And, and it's only very small lenses like 14.6, 14.9 that would have a spherical haptic as, as your, you know, illustration showed. So yeah, yeah. Th this really hit home. And the other thing is we've seen a trend towards quadrant specific lenses. And of mm -hmm. course you and I are, are about to talk about, you know, um, individually designed, you know, empirically designed lenses uh, that addresses this irregularity that, you know, 60% of our patients uh, yep. need that kind of lens. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. So I wanted to just kind of go over with the, the viewers on what profilometry actually is, because I remember hearing that term and thinking, well, what the heck is that? <laughs> that's, that's not something I think I learned in optometry school. But basically, basically, it's a way to get this topographical data from some sort of surface. Um, and there's different machines out there and instruments that Dr. Arnold and I are going to talk about. But uh, and most of them are using some sort of a, a, light, a light source to, to do this. And currently, you know, as of today, uh, there's three instruments on, on the market that, that are able to do this. One is the SMAP 3D. Um, I have a lot of experience with that device. Uh, Tom Arnold has the Eaglet ESP and the Pentacam CSP in his office. So we're going to kind of talk about these different instruments, kind of the differences, pros and cons, and kind of who would be a good candidate. So this is just kind of some uh, examples of the information that we would be seeing if we were taking the image from the Eaglet or the um, SMAP or the CSP. And this kind of is showing us um, what, what kind of information the, the, inf the data has kind of collected and put onto like a color point. And Tom, are you using this information uh, like right off the bat? Are you, are you taking an image and then you look at it and say, huh, uh, well, according to this, you, we really have got to consider a very high amount of toricity or does that kind of guide your prescribing habits or recommendations to patients? It really does. It really serves two purposes, Stephanie. Uh, the one you just articulated, it, it gives me a lot more information about how complex the case is and you know, what kind of lens do I think, it, it, what kind of features of a lens are needed to fit this particular patient. But I think, you know, technology also has a, uh, another aspect or benefit in patient care, and that is explain the patient the nature of their problem. And uh, over the years, as we've added various instruments uh, to our practice, the patients go, there's a wow factor that, oh, I didn't understand. No one's ever explained this. I've never seen this before. So it really helps kind of justify, uh, you know, that uh, this is going to take a while, it is more expensive, but I, I'm the expert, you know, you, you're in the right place to do this. So I think it helps, you know, explain, well, you know, why is this so difficult? And uh, so there's a little wow factor in it as well. That's awesome. I love the way that you uh, explain this to patients. Um, and so just like Tom alluded to before, it, this type of technology has really given us the ability to create these incredibly custom, unique lenses. So you can see with just by looking at this scleral lens, that is not a typical scleral lens that you see out of your fitting set. This is somebody that's got a very interesting, uh, complex eyeball. And just like Tom said, sometimes showing them what's going on with their eye and, and what the issues might be and why the, maybe they haven't had success with other things in the past, it really can kind of help the patient understand their own condition. I think that is so important. And then just a few slides uh, that of, of patients that would be good candidates. And of course, Tom, I want your opinion on all these, but um, first patient that comes to mind for something a little bit more custom or, or it, that would need some sort of profilometry or, her, or ha, would benefit is somebody where you, you, you have this, you, you put on the lens in your fitting set and you think, well, you know, inferiorly, it's looking pretty good. <laughs> but uh, at the three and nine, there's some real, 
real issues. Um, is this something, Tom, that you maybe would have seen a lot more maybe eight years ago? Oh, certainly. And be frustrated trying to fix it, you know, and uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because awesome. these elevations are different. Those lenses are landing at different places. We've all experienced uh, that lenses tend to be centered down and out. And be, that yep. be, because typically the nasal aspect of, of the eye is higher, it's flatter. If you know, go back, look at the slides that, that we saw earlier, um, the angle is, is less and it's, the elevation is actually higher. So in a typical with the rule, of course, we just talked about how, how there's nothing really typical. These lenses <laughs> will be center. And so you'll see, you'll see a lot of clearance below. And we'll talk about the shape of the, the, the limbus in a minute. But uh, it's also the elevation differences. So yeah, it's very, you look at this and go, you know, I, I need another answer. Absolutely. Um, here's another just patient that comes to mind. And these are a lot of patients that get referred to me and I'm sure they get referred to you all the time, Tom, where the, the practitioner has kind of done as much as they can with their traditional scleral lens designs and they don't really have the ability to fix uh, maybe a pinguecula that's getting smushed or a pterygium or just some sort of irregular scleral shape. So, this, so when I think who is a great candidate for uh, scleral profilometry or some of these more custom lenses, if I see any sort of pinguecula, I immediately point that out to them when I'm going through some of these images with them and showing them, you've got this area of tissue that's more elevated like a speed bump. So if we don't do something more custom, it's definitely, definitely gonna be uh, more challenging to kind of fit this area properly. And we may never be able to get to the end result like we would with the custom lens if we just keep going down this path. Um, and I know both of us have done that where we've just kept yeah. trying and trying to make modifications to some of the standard lenses and it's just not working no matter how many times we do it. And then at the end of the day, the patient gets frustrated and they're coming back a million times and then you're frustrated and the consultants from the lab are probably frustrated. So all around it can uh, provide a, a better experience. That's uh, true. It's better to identify it early and tell them <laughs> rather than have them come back and you not. But this is a great slide, Stephanie. Uh, and in going, you know, going through the this presentation, I, I wanted to point out this is a great slide and not only because it shows that it's riding up on the pinguecula, you know, as your el arrow illustrates, but, but notice how above and below the pinguecula there, you see the shadow. You, you see the big shadow, particularly from like two to, to three o'clock. And that just shows that pinguecula is lifting that lens off. So they're gonna feel it, it's gonna rub, they probably get some bubbles underneath it. So it's not just impinging on the bump and, you know, uh, inducing some redness, but it's just, it's not fitting well. And yeah, so, yeah, that's it's a great, great picture, Tom. great po photograph. You know. And here's actually your picture, Tom, uh, not a patient that you uh, fit to initially. This is somebody <laughs> that probably came to you uh, looking for help, but uh, can you tell us a little bit about this patient? I think you ended up fitting them into like an eye print from your That's slide. absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, I. Stephanie and I shared these slides and I said, well, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna give you a slide. I said, I did not fit this patient. <laughs> and, uh, this is my patient, but I didn't fit it. Uh, very interesting lady, this is a young physician actually, who was uh, had LASIK in India and she probably had early keratoconus that was not pre uh, detected. And so she's very, very ectatic, you know, just cornea did, was crazy. And wow. she was fit elsewhere and, um, yeah, it just it's as you see, it's too small, it's too tight, and she actually got some um, cholesis, conjunctival uh, cholesis, or uh, that's not the right word, but calcification, you know, whatever. It, it got really hard and brittle, and uh, yes, we did. That's exactly what we did. We we did an eye print on her to get over this much larger. It improved dramatically, like in six weeks, it was white and clear. But of course, the architecture changed. So we actually did another mold and, and she's quite happy. So yeah, oh, that's excellent. Oh yeah, that's a good example of, uh, uh, it just gets congested. You're just digging into there and pushing mm -hmm. it up. It's exposed and it just dries out. So it's always red and it's yeah. pretty nasty, but she did real well in a custom lens. Yeah. That's awesome. So uh, basically 
if you do scleral prophylometry or topography on, on, on patients in your practice, there's lots and lots of benefits. So just like Tom alluded to, um, it gives you excellent information about the scleral shape. And then you can have that conversation with your patient and say, hey, this is what's going on with your eyeball. And that is why I'm recommending this lens type. Uh, because these lenses are, are so custom and, and they're, they're made very, very well, it does save time. So not only the patient and the doctor time, but it's, it's really everybody's time that's involved in this whole process. So um, I like to tell people that when my first scleral lens patient during my residency took me 20 different lenses and seven months of both of our time. I guess granted, you know, I was a resident, so I didn't really know what I was doing in the beginning. So <laughs> that was to be expected. But uh, imagine now, you know, if somebody came in and they were trying to get fit with a, with a lens and they couldn't, uh, they had to keep coming back in a million times. I mean, people just don't have time for that anymore. Uh, I'm including myself. I mean, I want to go to whatever doctor I need to go to and Whatever is going to get me to the end result the fastest, I think that is is really important. And Tom, I'm really curious on, is this something that you explain to patients before you kind of decide on a, a lens to use? Or um, is the patient the one that's kind of in, involved in the decision making? Or, or are you just kind of making um, a recommendation or two based off of everything you see? Uh, you know, when patients come to us, they know they have issues and they know they're difficult. Either, either, you know, they have issues that they can't see or maybe they've been fit elsewhere and they see the benefit of a scleral lens, uh, but it just doesn't fit right. Um, and so they're open to, they want to be fixed and they want to get back to work or school. And, and as you well know, Stephanie, you know, having a, a specialty practice, you know, that's totally uh, focused on this. And we're a general practice, but we, as we built our practice, we have lots of referrals. And, and as you well know, people may come from hundreds of miles just for this, for your service. So I think it, we, we owe it to them to explain that we want to get to the end point, as you said, as quickly as possible to get them seeing well and getting comfortable. Um, and, you know, we, we may have good, better, and best, but, you know, we're the doctors and we say, this is what you need. And that goes a long way. I think, I think lots of times optometrists maybe are, are more timid about discussing fees or, you know, oh, we'll do something easy. If it's not, if that doesn't work out, we'll take the next step. And after that, and, but I've gotten more bold and just say, look, this is, this is what you need to do. And I always, I don't want to oversell people. I want to do what's appropriate for them, but it's up to us to, they're coming to us for our advice. And I think we owe it to them uh, to give them the best option we have. I love that, Tom. And that just goes to speak to what kind of doctor you are, as you know, as many doctors and patients know. You're just somebody that is very honest and trustworthy and, and somebody that's not going to just sell somebody something because they don't need it. They, you're actually telling them, hey, we want to do what's best for you. We want to get you to the end result the fastest, especially if they're traveling, you know, hundreds of miles. That's, that's I think, so important. And uh, thank you for sharing that. I think a lot of the listeners really are going to appreciate that, that token of, of advice. Um, something that we haven't really discussed is empirical ordering. So um, something that is really exciting about this profilometry data. So if you if you end up getting one of these instruments in your office is that you're able to capture the images and the laboratory is able to actually look at the image on their end and then they can create a lens that is really really custom to that patient's eye so you're not fiddling around with multiple trial lenses in office trying to figure out what the best fit is um, and would you say tom that this has decreased the amount of chair time with your patients Definitely. And this era of COVID and, and cleanliness and, and, and all this, patients appreciate that, you know, uh, they don't want two or three lenses that maybe have been on someone else's eye, you know, previously. So they are, they are concerned about that. And we, um, even if you use a diagnostic lens that your, profilom your profilometer may recommend, 
you can be pretty confident. My experience has been if I am doing a diagnostic lens, that lens that is recommended will fit. Now, I may modify it. I may want to tweak it. Uh, but I'm not putting on three lenses and I'm not putting on uh, brand A and, I, and it doesn't work and I'm putting on brand B and that doesn't work. Now I'm on to brand C. Uh, the lens that I select, um, I know is going to work uh, and uh, the diagnostic lens often is. So, so if I can just put one diagnostic lens on, that's good. But you know, Stephanie, We've done empirical fitting for corneal lenses for years. I mean, I don't, I don't do diagnostic fitting of corneal lenses at all. I, I take it from the topography and the, and the lab makes me a lens. So I think that's where we are. We're, we're, we're almost there. I think there's some more work to do, but I think in the next 12 to 20, 18 months, we probably won't be fitting many diagnostic lenses at all. Yeah. And that's so wonderful, you know, with this time in our, uh, careers and, and the culture with everything, like you said, just trying things on and, and somebody else has had it on and it, it, all this stuff with the fear with everything. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon. It just gives the patient a little bit more confidence as well, that you're not using all these lenses that were on a million people's eyes just, you know, a few hours ago. Well, so. and, the, and the other thing too <laughs> about the, about the corneal lenses is that, um, you know, if you're fitting, if you take a diagnostic corneal lens, say, and you know it's real is way off. Let, let's say, you know, you know, you need a bitorque, say, a four diopters of corneal cylinder. You put that diagnostic lens on just for whatever reason. You know, it's not going to fit. They're not going to be comfortable, and that's what that's their experience. That's your expectation. So you want that scarl lens, which scarls are by definition more comfortable, but you want it close, you know, so mm -hmm. if you have an empirically fitted lens designed for, you know, off their profilometry, uh, the wow factor is, is really, really good. Some manufacturers will make you a lens and make it Plano even, and right. you put it on, you'll explain to the person, you know, that this is still a template, but it fits. And now yep. we're going to give you the proper power. And so then you have one visit, not three or four. Yep. So. I know it has really changed the, the whole culture of scleral lens fitting. All right, Tom, I'll let you take it away with your case reports here. Okay, great. Well, this is a very typical patient that we, we've talked, you know, similar to the cases we talked about. Uh, here's someone who has keratoconus and all the associated signs with it. You can see he has a lot of astigmatism, oblique, 2040 in glasses, and he's, he's worn scleros before and sees the benefit in the vision but you know, he wasn't that comfortable. Uh, this gentleman actually came from a couple of hundred miles away where we brag about how big Texas is. So he, he was referred to me and driving in. So I went with an empirical lens, uh, a ScanFit Pro lens right off, right off the profilometry scan. And so for this one, I was using a, an Eaglet device, which I, I work with Eaglet. And uh, you can see that it is uh, using fluorophotometry. So we do use some, some fluorescein. Uh, gets us out to 20, uh, 20 millimeters with straight ahead gaze. So we're not engaging you know, any muscles. Uh, these are bisphere elevation maps. And uh, again, talks to the slide you were talking about earlier, Stephanie. If you look at the right eye, it's pretty typical with the rule sclerotoricity. So he's steep vertically and flat or horizontally. But look at the left eye. Look how asymmetrical that is. Uh, and this is an example of what, what Dr. Denier and Dr. Sanders and, and Jason Judlick have found in their study is that, yes, he, he's, he's steeper vertically than he is horizontally in terms of the veil. But look at the asymmetry in the steep meridian. There's like 300 microns difference. So even a toric happens is not going to work in this case. Yeah. So this is the and we so we imported this data. We imported this right into uh, the ScanFit Pro software, which talks uh, to this instrument as well as the Pentacam. So we're pulling the data right in. So there's no no transcription on, on our end. And yeah, this is. Uh, 
there's several steps that we go through uh, in the interest of time. I'm not doing every step, but the software defines the limbus. There's a picture of the eye. That's, that's the real eye. Uh, the software is saying this is where it thinks the limbus is. You can click on these points. You're in control here. You can click on the points, move them around. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And there's several steps. Uh, you get to this step, and this is designing the back surface of the lens. So this is how the lens is going to fit. Uh, the little golden area on the lower left there is, is a raised area for a pinguecula. We, they call that a bump. Uh, you can make it a multifocal. And if you look real carefully, you can see a little dotted blue line coming out of the apex. And that's the optical center of the lens. And you can move that around. And so, you know, you can look at the shape. This is scan data. It looks like molds, but they're not impressions like eye print. This is scan data from the eaglet. Uh, you can see we, you know, it's very interesting. There's a lot of data now, Stephanie, as you know, that the, uh, the limbus is oval. It's mostly oval. It's mostly wider horizontally and, and shorter vertically. Also, it's higher up vertically than horizontally. It can be against the rule, but typically they're like this. And on the lower right, you can see how that bump or, or um, like a micro vault is uh, made into the lens. So this is all, didn't touch it. This is all a scan. And so this is what the lens would look like. You can see that the, uh, the um, optical zone is indeed oval. And this is not a huge lens. You know, we're not talking about a 20 millimeter lens. I think this was, I, I forget what it is. I think it's 16 and a half, 16, eight, which is, you know, which is a very typical lens but no hands were made, 16.5, here we go. So uh, this is final prescription. Uh, you can see that he's got some astigmatism in the left eye. Uh, and you look at the optical zone, you see how different it is. It's almost, it's more than a millimeter different in the right eye uh, and, and not quite that in the left. So uh, yeah, pretty, pretty neat. And this is what it looks like. Wow. So uh, That's yeah. Beautiful. And here's yeah. the left eye. And here's the left eye. Yeah, right and left eye. And they're comfortable. Wow. He puts them on and goes, oh, "Man, this is it. This is this is what it should be." Yeah, that's, that's how you amazing. build your. That's how you build your practice. <laughs> wow, Tom, that's incredible. Thanks for explaining it. So it was so easy to understand how you know. Thanks for your explanation on kind of how you got the scan and then what the little points are representing. And it is fascinating knowing how the the cornea you know, the, the lenses are, are no longer around. We're, we're making these oval um, lenses. It's, it's, it's incredible now that we have so much more data about yeah. the cornea and the limbus and the sclera, you know, how the eyeball is, is really not, not round at all. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, and it's not just the limbus and the optical zone. Uh, mm -hmm. We're making lenses that are oval in shape. Yes. The, the whole, the whole lens. Yeah. Fascinating. So uh, again, this is uh, another illustration. This is the Pentacam, um, and it uses a Scheinflug camera, as you know, it's not fluorophotometry. Um, it takes a central image, and then the instrument actually moves up, down, left, right to get it. It goes out to about 18. Um, and if you look on the left there, the little blue bars, that's an illustration, and you see the, the angles there. So the camera spins around, takes takes us takes two seconds literally two seconds and this is uh their scan and so we call it fitting by the numbers uh you know and, and for for practitioners who are really just getting their feet wet the first thing you look at to me is what is the horizontal visible iris diameter now we know the vertical is probably going to be a little bit different but this is how you pick your first lens um, in this instrument it's called the horizontal white to white and it's we have a measurement there so, uh, you know, 11.6 is a very average uh, width. Uh, and so in this particular fitting set that I decided to use, I went with a 15.6. And, uh, and so this is, a, 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 this is the data we're getting off the um, Pentacam. And what I really want to emphasize here uh, is that 
you, you need to know for any given overall diameter of the lens you're using, it doesn't land on the outer edge. You know, a, a lens doesn't land on the, the extreme edge. It lands somewhere inside of that. And all the manufacturers, if you ask them, will share that information with you. My core diameter, where the lens is going to touch down, is where you need to take your sagittal depth measurement from. And so I know from this manufacturer, a 15.6 lens actually lands at 13.6. So the sagittal depth that I need to clear, well, is 33.55. Of course, I want to build in my clearance of the lens. I don't want it sitting on the cornea. So my fudge factor is 300. So I need a lens on the eye that has a sagittal depth of 36.55. That's the information I'm getting off this. And so uh, I go to a calculator. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of labs that you use now have online calculators. So which, whichever labs you like to use, ask them about that. So um, it's a normal HVID. It's a normal cornea. So kind of an average lens out of this fitting set would have a sag of 4,600. And so we put that in and we calculate, well, what, what is the sagittal depth of this lens on the eye if I pick a 4600. And as it goes down, it spits out the parameters and it says, well, the primary functional sagittal depth, and we're going to talk about where we get that term, is 3820. So I know if I put that lens on the eye, I'm going to be 165 microns too high. I want 300. That means this is going to be 465. So I don't want that. So then I go back to the calculator. So I say, okay, I want to drop it 150, which is what I do. So this is the lens I'm going to put on the eye. This is the first lens. Uh, then I, I, I'm going to do a little over refraction. Uh, yeah, there you go. I put, in, I put in my over refraction and then I calculate again. And it comes out to 3670. So I'm within five microns. So this, in this case, this is my diagnostic lens. And this is what I'll, what I'll order. Yeah. So another case, very similar, uh, moderate keratoconus. This gentleman comes from about 120 miles away. Uh, he was only diagnosed, as you see, uh, when he's about 34, which Stephanie, you know, keratoconus starts very early, you know, certainly in adolescence. Uh, and it, he was referred by a friend of mine in Beaumont, Texas, which is, like I said, about 120 miles away. And his chief complaint was, I, I haven't seen well in years. The guy just doesn't see. So I fit him actually several years ago. Um, let's go back to the topography like we talked about. Um, he's got a cone. I want to know the nature of the cone. And when I first saw this, Stephanie, I went, man, you know, that left eye looks so much worse than the right. It's got this big cone. It's low, you know, low and outside, you know, like my friend Bill Potter would say. You look at the right eye and you go, that's a central cone. That ought to be easy to fit, but look at the difference in the vision. Mm -hmm. And if we go to the next slide, wow. uh, and this is where, uh, this is not profilometry, this is uh, Scheinflug. It shows the front elevation and the rear elevation, because we all know that for most keratoconus, it starts in, in the rear and moves forward. So you can see here is his K max is much different in the right eye. Um, he's a lot thinner. The elevation's a lot, a lot worse. So indeed, the right eye is the more difficult eye in terms of vision. Something, something again, you know, my, myself coming from a, a rigid lens background, you know, starting in the 80s, I mean, we're used to topography of axial topography or, or tangential topography where, where, you know, where, where the highest point, where, where the most the area of most curvature would be red, right? And the area of least curvature would be blue. But we all know that in, in elevation maps, that's the opposite. So it's important to get your mind around, these, these are corneal uh, scans, of course, but the same thing is what we see on the um, sclera. And so the red point is the highest point, okay? And then the, uh, the highest and flattest in this term, case and the blue surrounding it is the steep meridian so you're gonna y your task here in fitting this is to get over that high point but not have excessive clearance you know as you get off that and so uh, so that's one point point two is 
how well can we get these people to see it's it's much easier you can expect better visual acuity when the the maximum elevation in the front and the rear line up as they do in these cases and in this case you know not so much right so there's your front elevation look at look how um, ectatic and distorted the rear is so uh, again, these are elevation maps, and we're looking at the cornea, and this is this is the Scheinflug of that same eye. So I fit this guy in a custom lens, and he won a he won a, a shooting clay tournament. <laughs> oh, that's cool! He won a shooting clay tournament. But anyway, going back to our friend from Beaumont, so I fit him last year, early last year, uh, in scroll lenses, and he really liked them. But the left lens started bothering him. You can see that he had a cylinder in his prescription. I, I also had 200 microns of, of tericity, which I thought would be good. But you can see from my little drawings uh, that the left lens was rotating and, and dropping and abrading his cornea. Wow. So that was not good. And one thing, uh, our, mm -hmm. our good friend Karen Carrasquillo has, has mentioned this a bunch of times. She said, no, no, no follow-up visit is complete unless you take the lens off and stain it. Uh, so, you know, it's a very good point. And so when I do this, you can see his abrasion. You can see how it's kind of digging in there. And so uh, my strategy, you know, why, again, going back to, uh, no, that's fine. That's fine. Going back to what we keep talking about, this is uh, Greg and San, Dr. Sanders and Dr. Denier and Jesse Lake. They, these are their findings, Stephanie, that you articulated earlier. Yeah, this is such important information and uh, it, it wasn't well known and it's just so amazing. And I, I just love seeing all the new data come out because it really shows you know, even what we know now, I'm, I'm so interested in seeing what's it going to be like in, when we have five years yeah. of, of data with, with these different uh, shapes of people's scleras and people that have regular astigmatism versus irregular and different, um, yeah. uh, different conditions. You know, does that affect the scleral tericity pattern? And I think we're just going to be able to get so much more information now that we have this incredible technology. Yeah, uh, this paper is just, as you can see, November 2017. It's, mm -hmm. it's not three years old. Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. paper. I, uh, as you said, I have it in almost all my lectures. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it's so groundbreaking. Uh, but going back to what we talked about, primary functional sagittal depth, that is the actual depth at the core diameter that you're trying to fit. Uh, and, and that's an important that is that is the clearance of the lens and it comes from this very good paper which is a little over a year old uh, mm -hmm. by some good friends of ours Stephanie who you all you know all these all these nice folks good folks uh, and we're trying to simplify the, the terms we use because every manufacturer God love them it has different names for everything and it's extremely confusing uh, and there's an attempt uh, by these fine researchers and doctors, practitioners, and others, to let's all let's all use the same. Let's all let's have Esperanto for scleral lenses. <laughs> yes, I I think that would be wonderful. I know that the Scleral Lens Society has done such a a great job and and in helping this come to life. And uh, yeah, it's exciting to see where this ends up going in the next few years too. And I'm just going to so, kind of move on here. Yeah, We're running sure. out of time here. So I'm just oh, going to okay. end with this case report and, yeah. and then we'll, we'll kind of conclude here. So um, I had a 79 year old female and she was referred to me by her ophthalmologist here in Las Vegas. She does have a history of RK scarring in both eyes and she had epithelial ingrowth repair in the right eye about three months before she came to see me. And she does have significant cataracts. Her symptoms were poor vision, double vision, fluctuating vision, and she just basically says, I can't see anything. Her vision in her right eye was 2400, and she said she saw double, and then in her left eye, she saw 2070, also seeing double. Take a look at her uh, topography. Um, you know, that's, it, there's definitely some flattening and, and irregularity. You can tell that she has had RK. Not uh, too bad as far as some of the crazy topographies that Tom and I see in our regular 
basis. So I thought, okay, well, the topography is not looking that bad. So, you know, there, there's definitely a chance that there could be improvement. And um, she's got some RK scars, kind of hard to see in this photo. But then you can also see she's got some interrupted sutures inferiorly. And then the biggest uh, challenge was she's got basically three plus NS cataracts. So I thought, oh, geez, she's got you know, RK, she's got this irregular astigmatism, she's got um, some surgical repair, and she's got uh, some pretty significant cataracts. So I didn't even know if this would even work, but the surgeon is the one that said, I don't think she needs to be going through cataract surgery right now. Let's just see what she can get in a, in a scleral lens. So I thought, well, I mean, I guess I'll try, but I was very clear with the patient that this may not work at all, but First, you know, let's just try something and kind of see what happens. So we performed an S-map on her, very similar to uh, the eaglet that Tom talked about where you have to use fluorescein. So you use fluorescein and then you basically have the patient look straight ahead, up and down, and then that captures the um, profilometry for that patient's eye and then stitches the images together. So amazingly, with uh, the diagnostic lens that was uh, recommended, and with an overrefraction, she does have some um, uh, astigmatism going on there, but she was able to see 2030 in the right eye. So going from 2400 to 2030, especially with that dense cataract, I was pretty amazed. Um, same thing with the left eye. She does have a lot of astigmatism going on, also 2030. Uh, and she was happy. So she said, this is the best I've seen in years. Like, let's just go for it. So I thought, well, might as well try. So decided, let's do it. She's got a lot of cylinder going on. And because I wanted the, the cylinder correction to be very stable, I recommended going with a, a custom uh, scleral lens, which uh, in this case is called the latitude. So she decided to go for that in each eye. Here's uh, her dispense. You can see that the lens is, is fitting quite well. So even though she's got some scleral toricity, not a big issue. Uh, 238 microns of clearance, I'm happy with that. Lens dispense for the left eye, beautiful fit. That looks great. And again, she's got um, adequate amount of, of central clearance right off the bat. And then she sees 2025 with the lens on and 2020 in the left eye. So this was like this case where I was like, I don't even know if this is going to help at all, but let's just try it just to see. Um, and I don't think that I could have gotten this good of vision if I would have done a regular scleral lens. And that's just because of how much extra tericity on the front surface we had to add. And as you know, Tom, it has to be so stable uh, for yes. that vision to lock into place, which is where some of these custom scleral lenses really really shine stable and centered that you yes. centered it exactly so that's yeah. where you know when i see a patient now that has some uh toricity on the front so that if they've got some internal astigmatism going on i almost always tell them listen we've got to go with something more custom because i need that lens to sit exactly where we want it to sit i can't have this thing being rotated because your vision's going to be bad and then you know, you're going to be unhappy. Uh, she did great two-week follow-up, no issues. Uh, we saw her for three month, about a month back. She's still doing amazing. So um, the there's a, a couple questions. I just wanted to answer a couple, and then I wanted to um, turn it over. But if you guys do have questions, uh, Tom and I are, are, we're such advocates for this type of information. Happy to share. This, this webinar will be recorded, and, and uh, posted. So I'll make sure to email all of you guys uh, in case you want to look at it again. I mean, Tom had some amazing slides if you wanted to go through step by step how he was talking and that was incredible. Um, and then we both have social media things that you can follow. And uh, definitely, if you haven't followed Tom's, make sure you do because his photos are just absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, and then just one question, Tom. I wanted to kind of ask a question that came in earlier in this uh, in the in the conversation. What, which for you is, would profilometry take the place 
of eye print in Tom's case. And I think that was, it was one of the first cases that we had presented. No, it doesn't take the place. Um, eye print still would be your definition. I mean, that's going to be the most accurate. In fact, those three profilometers were, were standardized against molding, you know, eye, eye print molds. Uh, so for, for a very, very ectatic eye, a really torn up eye, um, eye print still would be the best thing. But uh, the, this profilometry is those in-between patients, just like kind of what you just illustrated, uh, Stephanie, you know, more difficult, challenging, uh, but not crazy. Yeah, excellent. Um, and then just one more, uh, what is the average number of lenses before the final uh, with the profilometry versus without it? Um, and I, I have actually, the, the, one of our good friends, John Gellies, Dr. John Gellies, actually exactly. did an audit of himself. And he did, he's got a ton of information on this exact uh, yeah. research within his own clinic. And I believe it was something like, without using profilometry, it's like 2.7 lenses per patient. And then with, it was like 1.2 or something like that. Um, Tom, do you think that that is kind of reflective of what you're seeing? Yeah, I, th I think uh, we all know John, and that those are the numbers that I recall as well. And uh, that two point, he does crazy eyes, Stephanie, as you do. You know, he's in a specialty corneal practice, and he does hard stuff one after the other. And for him to have that kind of um, um, a result, you know, with, with the person of his skill really speaks to the technology really uh, improving. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's great. If, if it helps John, it'll help everybody. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Well, thanks Tom for spending your evening with, with me and, and our listeners. Um, this formally concludes thanks. the CE portion of the event. And so now 